Disrupt Disability Arts Festival Project Arts Centre. Um, tomorrow morning, if you are interested in something we didn't have a great deal of in this year's programme, which is, which is dance and movement, there's a really great online session with neuroscientists talking about dance, um, led by Edge Hill University, Vicky Karku. Um, I think around about 10 o'clock. And if you were lucky enough to enjoy the IMA program or are curious about the Irish Museum of Modern Art program, Barbara Ann's program, uh, you are invited to go to the Irish Museum, Museum of Modern Art tomorrow afternoon at two. There's also a really beautiful little thing starting in the pr uh, uh, printing house square. So there's a new area of, of Trinity's campus where they are trying to make a space a little bit like Sue's space, a space for uh, a creative gym, a space of calmness and craft. And uh, they're going to open that tomorrow uh, at 12. So have a look in the program online. You'll see all of that. Before I dive into the program this afternoon and introduce people, I want to do one thing that we didn't manage to do on Monday in the before times. So on Monday, we um, introduced people from the Atlantic Fellows Program by ex giving them a cert. And one of the fellows was still traveling. So, Marks, are you out there somewhere? Would you like to come join me for a minute? Hello. Come join me for a sec. So, Marks didn't know I was going to do this. So, I, you know, it's nice. A little bit of improvisation goes a long way. Um, we are delighted that you were able to join us and that you made the journey from DRC. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Um, so the work Marx does is extraordinary and if you get a chance to ask him about the work he's done in Burundi and the work he's doing in DRC, grab his time. Um, in conversational studies, if you study conversations, uh, those people that do such a thing realise there are four spaces. And in the first two, people are kind of mapping out the territory and what will we talk about. And then in the third, they kind of start to get into the good stuff. But the really good stuff is in the last 10 minutes, when your brain knows that you're leaving, okay? You know you're going out the door and you just cut to the chase. And it happens all the time. There's one other thing that happens, which is when you go out of the door, you meet the muse of the staircase. And the muse of the staircase is that, oh, oh I wish I said that thing. Uh, thanks to the internet, we can stay with the Muse of the Staircase. We can keep this conversation going. So if you don't manage to get to the things that you want to do, there is a chance to do that. Um, so this afternoon's session is, this morning we were talking about love and when love's not enough, really from a systemic kind of point of view. What we wanted today to be is laddering up and laddering down. We can all see. We can all think of examples of, of care and compassion driven by love. We wanted to show some of those examples. And so these are generally small emerging projects or mature projects or projects made by people with great experience where they are trying to make tiny interventions into the world, I guess. Um, and I am going to share them with you because it's my great pleasure to be able to do this. So, without more ado and less of me, I'd like to introduce Sue Mayo. Hello. Nice to meet you on stage. Yeah. Do you want, are you going there? Yeah. 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 So I'll, um, uh, Sue and I have been having probably a 30 year conversation at this stage about what creative stuff does. Uh, and we started as a group called Artistic Directors Anonymous, which we're not going to talk about now, because it was anonymous. Um, but one of the great things about working with, with Sue is, um, is, is the depth and breadth of mature creative practice. And so I think of you, I say this and you'd be embarrassed, as a kind of guru of that kind of work. Um, so, yeah. And so... <laughs> Uh, I'm going to get out of the way and leave you to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic. Dominic and I spark off in each other the ability to talk nonstop, probably with quite a lot of nonsense in it. So I'm hoping that I've reined back from that 
and uh, will give you a bit more clarity this afternoon. So I'm talking about a project that I run, Breaks and Joins. I'm a freelance artist who works mostly with communities. I've worked also a little bit in academia, but uh, freelance practice is where my heart lies. And Breaks and Joins began as a project that was going to last for 18 months, and that's four and a half years ago now. Uh, for partly reasons of having to change it because of the COVID uh, pandemic and the lockdown, but also because we never stop finding out more about what this topic of repair uh, can bring us in terms of conversation and action. We are a team of five uh, people who are respectively myself, a digital artist, a conflict resolution specialist, a buildings manager who runs a repair cafe, and a visual artist. So we are a very diverse team in terms of our, uh, our own work lives and the shapes that that brings into our lives. We have different disciplines, we're many ages, uh, and we bring all those skills together in it. And a repair cafe, if it's not a term that's familiar to you, is a space that is run by volunteers who know how to mend things. They are mostly drop-in places on the whole, maybe operating once a month, and people can bring things to be mended. Uh, the one that we work with closely is just one person, but near to me there's one where there are 12 repairers, uh, textiles, woodwork, electronics, and electrics. And they have certainly in the UK kind of come into the space left by people who would mend things for you. So shops, manufacturers, they've come into a, a, a kind of emptiness where mending completely disappeared from the material world. And you'll hear that mentioned several times. Uh, I'm going to mention quite a lot of people uh, when I speak today, and um, they you will find out more about them on our website, through our podcasts. I haven't referenced them all. Um, I think uh, it's good to tell you that I sent ahead of time some images and a film, but I didn't decide what to say until last night, so I couldn't do PowerPoints with words on. So you're going to get a kind of background uh, of images uh, while I speak, but if you want to know more about any of the people I mentioned, they're all there uh, as part of the community that we've gathered around us. I wanted to start actually with our film. After we had been working for nearly three years, we decided to try to capture not exactly what we do, but what we were thinking about and the kind of flavour of what we were doing through a very short film, which I'll show you now. I can see in people's eyes, in people's reaction, people want to mend. You can see the guilt. He said, you know what? I don't want this to end up in a, in a landfill. It's better for me to try than not to try. I'd like to have a go. I, yeah, I believe in sustainability. I think the way we live now is just not sustainable. Just keep like a slow away society. I'm of a generation where it was very difficult to buy things so if you wanted something you either had to earn a lot of money to to purchase it or you had to make it yourself i got a, a new jumper and it suddenly had a rip in it and i had a friend who dined it up for me really beautifully and it's my favorite bit of the jumper because it's now it's just like a little bit that's all in color and i think what i love about mending is that it's not perfect and you, you can always track it back. And when someone's done that for you, it's like wearing a little piece of, of friendship or of, of love. I don't know, that's really cheesy, but I think I like, I like that a lot. I love the part where you work out how to do the mend. The first thing I do is work out how it should work, and then I get going. If someone made it, someone can repair it. Safety pins. They are my life saviour. Anything I mend, I mend with safety pins. They simply hold everything together. 
If you don't repair things, it's like you don't care for yourself. Whilst they're unmended, they drain energy. I'm not against breaking things. Some things need to be broken, even the law sometimes. Break it to repair it. I just wasn't sleepy at night because I was so scared really about the whole climate crisis. To worry about, I've got kids, to worry about the future for them. And I suppose it's just all about, yeah, things being truly sustainable and the way we live now, we're taking more out of the earth than we're putting back and we're having this kind of unnatural fight with nature that we can't win. It upsets me when things that only require a little bit of input end up in landfill. Whenever I go to the, the dump, I see these bikes there that are just going to be thrown away and it's, it breaks my heart because for a little bit of input, they would be a functioning bike again. People are can be very wasteful. When things get broke, they end up in a landfill because nobody can repair them because the manufacturer company, the big guys, they don't want us to repair. So they just want us when things broke, get rid of it, end up in a landfill, go buy a new one, you know. People crave mending and togetherness and connection, but somehow there seems to be increasing disconnection with people. They've got broken those connections. I can fix an object that isn't mine, but I would be very wary of thinking that I could fix a community that isn't mine. How do you repair a broken bowl that was smashed through invasion, occupation? Maybe through the sharing of a bowl of olives, peace can be restored. I think there's so much needs mending that even starting to lift it sort of feels like an impossible task. And I think sometimes the way we respond to that is to not fix anything at all. No, I don't think everything can be mended. Some things have to be replaced, you know, and that's just the way it is. Living with fractures and working with communities where things can't be mended, we have to learn how to sit in the fire with communities and help them to navigate the crises that affect them. I was working so hard to fix it when I realised that not everything can be mended. It was a relief. Okay. Not everything can be mended. Let's live with that. Right now, my three-year-old believes that I can fix almost anything. And as he grows up, he is going to realise that I don't have those kinds of superpowers. Although I will try. And it will be my job to teach him how to fix things for himself. And... I hope I'm up to the task. The climate changes how it's affecting us. I don't know if I'll be alive for something to be devastated to be happen. Well, definitely it will happen to our children or our grandchildren. So we have to make a better place for them. Seriously, we have to make a better place. We can fix it. We don't just need to mend. We need to make amends. Make amends. Bits missing. She liked pearls. I gather her up. What I love about the mending community is that people always help each other out. If we didn't know before that we belong to each other and were made for one another, we do now. There's an awful lot to do. 
and I'm starting with small stitches. Remember, the mends must always be much bigger than the tear. So the project emerged, as often happens, I think, from the collision of two things. One of them was that Chuck Blue Lowry, the digital artist in our team, and I discovered this one-man repair cafe in Telegraph Hill in South London. And Mo Suma is the building's manager, and once a month, he's open for business to mend whatever people bring to him. And we went along to watch, and we noticed this extraordinary quality that he had. He had curiosity. He wasn't panicked by anything that anybody brought. He had tenacity. He went on and on looking for a solution. Sometimes he kept things and said, come back next week, I'm gonna figure this out. And he had extraordinary imagination. What could he do? And I think we both felt that these qualities were something so needed in our experience of the world at this time. And at the same time, I was reminded that uh, some years ago, I had been really struggling with a particular challenge and I'd done something very unusual for me, which was to go to the library and get a self-help book. They're not my style in general. And I found one and I opened it. And the first line was, not everything can be mended. And I closed the book and put it back. That was all I needed to know. I was released from a cycle of trying to fix something, accept something. And instead, I suddenly understood it's broken. That's it. That's what I will live with. And somehow those two ideas clinked together and came up with a new idea. And Chuck and I decided that we would gather with others to think about the repair of our stuff, ourselves, and our communities, and how the kind of wisdom and learning and the challenges which emerge from all of those three areas can really teach one another something. Just after we began, we went into lockdown in the UK, and we had to completely reframe the project. But something else happened during lockdown, and that was that in, in our situation, and I appreciate I'm speaking quite culturally specifically, we're based in London and uh, we've done some work in Northern Ireland and in the north of England, but mostly we're in London. It was as if something that had been covered up was uncovered during that time. The first thing was the importance of cleaners. Suddenly, the, the role of cleaners in hospitals became really clear to everybody. The most neglected, the most unnoticed people in the hospital were absolutely crucial at that time and underpaid and overworked. 
the fragility of life became much clearer. The joy of the everyday became much clearer. The fragility of our systems became much clearer, that we actually weren't ready for this. And our unfamiliarity with death. And I think we believed at that time that the cover that had come off these things would stay off and we would emerge into a kind of new paradigm. But it hasn't happened. The lid has gone very firmly back on those things. But that opened up to us some of the richness of what we were going to go into. And as we progressed through practical repair, through understanding well-being, mental ill health, and the repair of ourselves, and we started to think about communities and systems, we discovered joy, and we discovered incredible inventiveness, but we also discovered rage, and we discovered despair. In one session, we were doing garden, we were looking at mending garden implements. And uh, this lady had brought a fork and uh, the, 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 the bits of a fork are called tines. And this will be familiar to gardeners. One of them was bent like that because it had hit a stone. So it had a bent tine. And one of the people who'd come along had a really good solution for straightening it. And um, she, couldn't, she couldn't manage it. She wasn't strong enough. So she called Mo over and Mo pulled on the pipe that you used to mend it and he snapped off the tine. And we suddenly thought, oh, we've really entered the world of brokenness here. And he picked up the fork and said, well, you've got a three-tined fork now, so that's okay. And that was one of those moments when we began to understand we were going to constantly hear really helpful and interesting things that would progress us in our kind of search for what it was that a discussion about brokenness and repair would bring to us. So what we do is that we run a regular workshop uh, in a community centre in South London. We mostly have adults, some young adults, some older adults, but it's in the week, so it's people who are not working or can't work or are out of work or have retired. And uh, we call this the heartbeat of the project. And that's where we try out many, many of the ways of working uh, with our group. And because we've now done uh, five projects, we're on our fifth project with them, they tell us a lot. They give us a lot of feedback. And uh, we develop a lot of our ways of working with them. We run training. We run training in something called community conversations. And this is a way of working to help people who want to become active in their community as community builders who want to help manage uh, to deal creatively with conflict that might exist in a community, or they just want to become a much more active agent within their community. We run training for people who work in social justice uh, or um, in, in care, on resilience, um, and those are the sort of two direct offers that we have. The rest of what we do is about connecting and it's about noticing. So we have a podcast and we search out people who are involved in repair. And this might be the actor, uh, David Labby, who has created a solo show about how he has repaired his very damaged relationship with his father since his father's death. So it's a show about trauma and managing to find a way to make steps now towards his father after his father's death. It might be an organization. Uh, we have a wonderful conversation between Civic Square, who are an organization in Birmingham in England, and the Ubele Foundation, who are an organization in London, who are really looking at social change and how to make things happen, but both have a very embedded community practice. It may be an individual artist like Maria Amidou, who is exploring after many years just coming to explore her own experience of having been fostered as a child. 
It may be people who've broken a bone and have really struggled with waiting for it to mend and the effect of their lives. And we see that as a kind of foraging exercise, looking for these organizations and looking for these individuals to share this wisdom and, and really lift up this conversation about repair, mending, and what cannot be mended. I think it's important to think about how we connect these spheres. And I want to just tell you a story with permission of somebody who came to the repair cafe in Telegraph Hill. A young woman arrived with a baby and she had brought something I didn't recognize at all. And she said, oh, it's a steam cleaner. So I asked her what you did with a steam cleaner, a handheld steam cleaner. And she said she would bought it for her wedding dress. And apparently when you've, you know, traveled your wedding dress somewhere, you use a steam cleaner to get the creases out. And um, she had then wanted to use it for the christening gown for her baby <clears throat> and discovered that it didn't work. So the christening had gone ahead, but she'd brought it along for Mo to mend. While she was waiting in the queue, I asked her when she got married. And she explained to me that she got married during COVID when there was a restriction on the number of guests and that she and her partner had spent a long time deciding whether or not they should wait till everything was over or go ahead with only 30 guests. And they had decided to go ahead with 30 guests. And she said it had been beautiful and they never regretted it. And then I asked no more questions, but she said the amazing thing was that because uh, we only had 30 guests, I, we, we could afford to have IVF. And uh, she said she had always known from a teenager that she had very low fertility and that she would need to have IVF if she ever wanted to get pregnant. And so this extraordinary thing had happened. They suddenly had the finance to, to pay to have IVF. And, and here was the baby. And we all met this beautiful little baby. And then a man who'd been listening on the other side of the table said, I hope you don't mind, but my wife is about to have a baby and we don't know anybody in the neighborhood. C could we swap numbers so that we could maybe go for walks afterwards? And she said, oh, that would be great. And I know this really good group for new parents and their babies. Why don't we go to that together? And I realized that I had just witnessed the material, the personal and the community repair in front of my eyes. It's not something we are doing. We're not trying to link these things. Sorry. These things, they, they're linked. And I think that example demonstrated it beautifully. And she said to us when she left, this has helped me understand that pregnancy mended me. We have really become allergic to ideas of fixing. <clears throat> I don't know if it's a subtlety that we've brought into things, but the word fix seems to us to suggest that it's ended, that the mend has ended. And of course, there are some things that can be mended, maybe a bicycle tire, and they look just as they were before. But what was much more in our awareness was that anything that is mended bears the marks of its mending, a person, a community, an object, that that becomes part of its history. And it seemed very important to acknowledge that not everything can be mended. But what we were increasingly hearing from people was that not everything should be mended. And we met more and more people who were saying, we are living with very damaging systems. And some of the systems we need to put to one side. We need to reinvent. We need to think again. And we met people who are working organizationally, uh, like Dark Matter Labs, to rewrite the way contracts are done, uh, employment regulations are done. Um, at Civic Square, where they are trying to move into a new building, they're examining everything to do with land registry, what is the land under the building that you're buying, how is that managed, who does it belong to, to really re-examine the power structures and think about what may need to be set to one side and allowed to wither, and that's an expression that we heard this morning, to make way for the new. But also more seriously, when do we need to make our stance an act of refusal that we won't anymore 
join in with and collaborate with really damaging systems? When do we need to refuse to be menders? When I learnt to darn, I learnt from my grandmother, who had the wonderful first name, Violante, which I share with you just as an extra there. I loved her name. And she would make great, great effort to find exactly the same wool as the thing that was being darned. It had to be the same colour and it had to be the same weight. And this is because the darn had to be invisible, because nobody must know that you were wearing a mended garment. And mending has... For some people, a, a, a feeling just of pleasure and enjoyment, but it also, for many people, is about poverty. And to mend, as our great friend Rose Sinclair, who I'll talk about a bit more later, said to us that in her house, mending was not for leisure or pleasure. It was for need. And nobody in her house uh, was allowed not to know how to sew on a button because... Uh, they couldn't go to school if they didn't have all the buttons on, and if a button fell off, they had to sew one on. This was not about a, a, a craft activity. Rose is now a textile lecturer at Goldsmiths, and one of the things she has to teach is uh, crafting for well-being. And I'm really aware that sometimes she doesn't want to teach it because she's quite worried by uh, something that she knows is to do often with need. Uh, suddenly being elevated into something that might make you feel a little bit relaxed if you pay quite a lot of money for this lovely crafting pack from a, a specialist. I spoke to a repair cafe host from Manchester. He, he's part of a very big repair cafe in Levenshume in Manchester. And he said he had observed that three kinds of people brought things in to mend. People brought them in because they needed to, because they couldn't carry on without their bicycle. They couldn't get to work without their bicycle. They couldn't uh, iron anything. They couldn't iron their children's school uniforms and they were really worried. So that was one of the groups of people who came in. Another group of people came in, wanted to learn. So they would come in so that they could be taught how to repair because they wanted to become much more self-sufficient and they felt they'd lost the skills or had never been given the skills. And then the third group of people were those who were feeling a, a massive sense of anxiety about uh, climate justice and the disposability of the stuff that we have around us and wanted to become part of a movement that really shifted all of that. And this brought into our minds the, a real sense of urgency around the theme that actually we weren't just talking about a sort of quotidian uh, activity that it would be nice to see revived, that actually for so many people we were meeting, there was an incredible sense of urgency about their need to see that we were becoming active about mending, laying down or breaking. An organisation called Healing Justice London said... Investment into archaic moulds instead of deeply imaginative and brave work that meets people's needs and reconstructs nostalgic imaginaries to keep us docile, depleted and compliant. And this is a real warning about fitting into systems which actually we need to move away from. And I wonder how we fit together these two ends of the scale, this refusal and this desire to repair. And I'm very aware from our small community group on a Monday that sometimes what emerges in that group is a new piece of knowledge that people suddenly realize something that they really hadn't grasped before, something about repair. Somebody brings something to repair and, and a new piece of knowledge emerges. But I'm also very conscious that what is going on in the group also is that we are being surprised 
into remembering how much knowledge that we have. The late great actor, writer, and director, Ken Campbell, I've just forgotten his name, how terrible, said, we have to astound the self into being. We need to spend our lives astounding the self into being to remind ourselves of the knowledge that we have. And I think there's something in there that tells us how we connect these two ends, the need to repair and the need to leave behind. Throughout our conversations, particularly through the podcasts, we have accumulated extraordinary pieces of wisdom. A mender called Molly Martin, who is an expert in the Japanese technique, sashiko, where you stitch tiny stitches across the fabric to strengthen it, said to us very firmly, a patch is not a mend. If you put a patch on the knee of your jeans, that's not the mend. The mend is the tiny stitches the tiny stitches that strengthen it, that consistently cross it in both directions. And a little while later, we were talking to a, an extraordinary visionary social justice campaigner, Imi Kaur, and we told her this story and she stopped for a moment and she said, that's what we need. We need the tiny stitches when we're building community. And she said, I think, I think that's intergenerational conversation. I think that's what that is. I think we need to be building intergenerational conversation so that we're not patching. We are really strengthening with everything that we do. And as you saw at the end, Rose, I'm going to just speed up a bit because I think I'm getting over my time. Rose said to us, not to us, she said to a lady who was mending a nightdress, remember, the mend must always be much bigger than the tear. And this is a piece of wisdom which goes across all of these areas, the repair of the stuff, the self and the community. We so often see that initiatives only attend to the tear. But of course, around a tear in a piece of fabric, the whole fabric is weakened and the mend must be much bigger than the tear. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. So, do I have a mic back?